Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Morrissey. I'm Editor-in-Chief of FEMS Yeast Research, and I'd like to welcome all of you to this afternoon's webinar. Um, this is a fourth webinar in our uh, yeast research uh, series, but it's actually about the 21st, I think, that FEMS has organized. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us. Um, in case I forget, I will thank uh, Joe at FEMS now for his technical support and helping to set this up, and also our colleagues in Oxford University Press, uh, Sarah and Sadie, who've also been involved in uh, making this webinar happen. So I'm just going to share a few slides uh, by way of introduction to this afternoon's webinar, and then we will um, get going. Okay, so I think I'm sharing my slides now, but one of my colleagues will interrupt me and tell me if I'm not. So this webinar is organized by FEMS, the Federation of European Microbiology Societies. So I thought I would just say a couple of words about FEMS before we get into uh, the main um, purpose of the webinar. FEMS is a, a federation of microbiology societies uh, over 30,000 uh, microbiologists uh, across all European countries are represented by FEMS, and we carry out a lot of activities uh, to promote uh, the science of microbiology. One of the most important things that FEMS does, or one of the benefits that uh, a lot of researchers um, get from FEMS, is from the grants program, and um, several hundred thousand euro a year are paid out in grants, um, to support all the types of activities you see on the right-hand side of your screen there, ranging from conferences, organizing conferences, attending conferences, um, research fellowships, bursaries, uh, and so forth. So um, a lot of funding from FEMS uh, comes back into the microbiology community. Now, the source of income for uh, FEMS, like all uh, scientific societies, um, is largely come from, from the publication of journals. And FEMS publishes seven journals uh, right across uh, the spectrum of microbiology. You, you, you can see the, the lists of journals on your screen there. Um, I'm editor-in-chief of Yeast Research, uh, properly placed in the center, uh, reflecting its importance. And uh, the FEMS journals uh, share a number of different uh, policies, uh, which include um, peer review, uh, by experts, um, the the publication of uh, science that that is interesting and relevant, and then uh, we we provide a lot of support for our authors through promotion and usual social media and and blogs and so forth, um, and, and also we provide lots of uh, community support activities. People might be aware that uh, the FEMS journals have moved to an open access model and uh, already uh, all of the FEMS journals, with the exception of uh, microbiology letters, uh, have become open access publications. Uh, it says on the slide from the start of 2024, but in fact that's being published from 2024, so any papers submitted now to any of the portfolio other than letters will be published in this open access model. Um, now, there are many, uh, many of you and, and many authors have um, the capacity to publish open access with FEMS without, without paying APCs through read and publish deals with your institutions. So you, so you should check um, if you've got that uh, with FEMS or with Oxford University Press. And also we, we operate a generous waiver scheme. So uh, nobody should let APCs uh, be a barrier to publication in our journals. It is very important that um, that we all continue to support uh, society publications because uh, it's the scientific societies, as I mentioned earlier, to provide resources back into the community uh, to support uh, researchers. Um, all of the scientific societies, of course, are nonprofit organizations. Specifically for FEMS East Research, um, apart from publishing uh, quality papers, we do support uh, the community with, uh, with special issues, uh, thematic issues, uh, poster prizes, uh, webinars like the one that we're hosting today, uh, with a very interesting series of retrospective papers that are really providing a historical overview uh, from some of the major figures in the yeast community over the last 50 years, um, and, and that's well worth reading. 
uh, as people might have seen from the Holden slide, uh, we published thematic issues. Uh, the most the three most recent thematic issues are highlighted here uh, in this slide. Uh, yeast and food and beverages, a memorial issue, uh, remembering the contribution of Lex Sheffers to yeast physiology, and uh, a, a special issue looking at yeast pathogenesis and drug resistance. The thematic issue for yeast and food and beverages was launched um, in recent weeks, and that's got a whole range of uh, review articles and primary research publications looking at different applications of yeast in, in food and beverages, um, not just the traditional ones that you might be aware of, but 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 also others. And indeed, the, the papers that form the backdrop and rationale for today's webinar uh, were both published in, in this particular thematic issue. Now, the webinar today, uh, Insights into the Evolution of the Lager Yeast Saccharomyces pastoranus. Uh, it's chaired by myself, um, Editor-in-Chief of MC Research. And we've got a panel of uh, three people, uh, Martin Zarenko and Matthias Hutzler, who are from uh, the Research Centre of Bayern Steffen for Brewing and Food Quality, uh, part of the Technical University of Munich in Germany, and Geraldine Butler uh, from the Conway Institute, University College Dublin uh, in Ireland. Um, Geraldine and Matthias are, are going to be our two main speakers, uh, and Martin uh, should be joining us for the panel discussion afterwards. I'm not going to give too much a, a, of, a, of a scientific introduction because uh, we've got our expert speakers. Um, but just to remind people uh, who might be attending that when it comes to making beer, uh, we have two major styles of beer. There's probably other sub styles, but the two major styles are ale or lager. And it's been known for a long time that we use two different yeast species for these. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is used to make ale. And uh, prior to the mid 1800s, uh, on a global scale, it would have been considered the, the predominant yeast or the most widely used yeast. And ales would have, would have been the most common beer style uh, globally. And it's a warm fermenter. And sometimes people talk about top fermentation. And I think this is something that Matthias will, will talk about later on. Lager, on the other hand, uh, which nowadays is probably accounts for about 90% of beer production, uh, prefers cooler temperatures for fermentation. Sometimes it's been called a bottom fermenting yeast. Um, and this, this yeast is Saccharomyces pasteuranus. Now, even though it's been known for a long time that, that uh, we have these different yeasts, uh, it was an unanswered question as to where Saccharomyces pasteurinus came from. Uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, a lot of the mystery was, was solved when Saccharomyces eubianus was uh, identified and it was shown that Saccharomyces pasteurinus is actually a hybrid yeast with uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae being one parent and Saccharomyces eubianus the other parent. Um, and as with all hybrids, uh, the, the hybrid species brought traits from both parents. But there are a lot of unanswered questions uh, that, 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 uh, that came from, from this discovery. And some of those unanswered questions will be recapped in the forthcoming presentations. And also, um, we, we, we had two papers published in the journal in the last year, uh, and, and the senior authors are with us today. Uh, Geraldine Butler and her group published a paper on Saccharomyces eubianus that has really changed our way of thinking uh, about this yeast. And uh, Matthias Hutzler uh, led, led a group of people who, uh, by looking at a historical view of, of brewing in Central Europe, were able to reconstruct a lot of the evolutionary past of Saccharomyces pastoranus and came, came forward with a very interesting hypothesis for how and when this yeast originated. And uh, Matthias uh, and later Martin uh, will, will, will be talking about that. So without taking up any more of the time, oh, sorry, and I should say just a few housekeeping things. So so we've got two presentations now. Um, first one is, is, is about 20 minutes uh, from, from uh, Professor Geraldine Butler. The second one is about 30 minutes from Dr. Matthias Hutzler. Um, we will just go from one presentation uh, to the other with a very brief uh, uh, segu by myself. We won't take individual questions um, between the presentations, but if and when you have a question, please type it into the Q&A. And uh, after we've had the two presentations, I will open the floor for the panel discussion. 
and the way that will work is that I will take a look at the questions that have been written in the QA, Q&A, and I will put them to the, the speakers as appropriate. Uh, you will be able to add in more questions into the Q&A at that time as well, if you have them. But I would encourage you, if you have a question as we go along, type it into Q&A and uh, we will answer it um, at the appropriate time uh, in the discussion uh, at the end. So without uh, without any more uh, time and taken up now, if I can uh, figure out how to stop sharing, I will. Uh, thanks. And I'll hand you over to Professor Geraldine Butler who is going to give her presentation. Hey, hi. It's great to be here and thanks very much to John uh, for the introduction. So what I'm going to tell you about is the story of our paper from FEMS research last, FEMS yeast research last December. Um, and I'm not really going to discuss what a lager is because you've heard a little from John and you're going to hear more from the next speaker. So from my point of view, a lager is 90% of what we drink. It's cold brewed. And most importantly, it's brewed using this hybrid yeast, as John described, Saccharomyces pastorianus. And we know that Saccharomyces pastorianus is a hybrid in the same way that a mule is a hybrid of a donkey and a horse. Except for this yeast species, the hybrids, the parents of the hybrids are Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and Saccharomyces eubianus. And there are two main lineages of Saccharomyces pastorianus that I won't talk about much, but essentially one lineage has approximately equal content from its two parents, and the other one has about twice as much from Saccharomyces eubianus as it does from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So we've known for quite some time that Saccharomyces pastorianus was a hybrid and that one of the parents was Saccharomyces cerevisiae. But as John said, it really took until 2011 before the second parent, the one that we now call Saccharomyces eubianus, was identified. And this was identified by Diego Libkind. I'm sure he really loves this um, photograph of him, very sterile conditions, handling his yeast samples here. And he was uh, sampling, looking for the parents uh, in, on notophagus trees in North Patagonia. And in these uh, southern beech trees, because they they have the equivalent ecological niche to oak trees, and in the northern hemisphere, many Saccharomyces species are found on oak trees. And he found quite a number of isolates, which we now call Saccharomyces eubianus. And he showed that these cold tolerant yeasts were very, very similar to the unknown, the then unknown parent of Saccharomyces pastorianus. So we know that, that uh, Saccharomyces pastorianus is a hybrid. We'll know, as you'll hear a lot in the next talk, that that hybridization event occurred in Europe. And now we have the discovery of the parent Saccharomyces um, eubianus in uh, Patagonia. And that led to lots of hypotheses as to how it might have got from South America to Europe, maybe during Columbus's travels. And it also led more importantly, perhaps to, to brewing um, what we now often call wild beers or beers made with wild yeast. And this is one um, from Heineken. Within the next few years, quite a large number of other Saccharomyces eubianus isolates were found. Um, some in Tibet and in West China, a few in North America, a few in New Zealand, and many, many more isolates from Chile and Argentina. Uh, and again, many more wild beers. And again, these are just some that are uh, made by Heineken. So the discovery in Tibet suggested perhaps a more likely route to Europe because we're all very well familiar with the, the silk routes along here. And it suggested perhaps Saccharomyces eubianus had made its way from Tibet to Europe along these routes. From much research in the last 10 years, we now know that the origin of Saccharomyces eubianus is pretty much, is definitely Patagonia. And this is a phylogenetic tree I've taken from a paper in 2020. And as part of this study, they showed, first of all, that the Saccharomyces eubianus isolates from um, Patagonia have much of the greatest diversity, which is what you'd expect if it's the origin, site of origin of this species. 
Uh, they've also shown that the, the isolates fall into several groups shown in these, these colored blobs here. So we've got populations down here called Pat Patagonia A, and we've populations up here called P Patagonia B. And then there's this little population over here, the one shown in purple, which is the, called the Holarctic clade. And what's interesting about this one in particular is that it contains the Saccharomyces pastorianus part, the, the Saccharomyces eubianus parent, parental part of Saccharomyces pastorianus. So that suggests that uh, the origin of the, the, the isolus that, that hybridized in Europe came from this purple clade, belonged to this purple holarctic clade. And uh, holarctic is a very nice definition. It essentially is a sort of a catch-all definition, uh, uh, covers all of the non-tropical parts of Europe and Asia and Africa and north of the Sahara. And basically what it means is the chunk of the world that does not include South America and Australia and New Zealand down here. So the isolate that looks most like the uh, Saccharomyces pastorianus one, which is the one shown in by the star here, the isolates that look looks are the closest to the Saccharomyces eubianus parent come from Tibet and, and Western China here. However, from this map, which was accurate a year ago, there were no isolates uh, found in Europe. And the, that really raises the question of whether there is a natural population of Saccharomyces eubianus in Europe or whether one made its way from Tibet or from somewhere else and uh, found a partner with Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now, in fact, even before a year ago, there were a few hints that there might be a European population. So, for example, Daniela Del, Del Neri, while sampling soils in, um, in North Italy, had found metagenomic evidence that perhaps Eubianus was there. And Jose Sampaio's group, looking at a completely different species, Saccharomyces uvarum, Saccharomyces uvarum, sorry, um, had evidence from the genome that there may have been some introgression, there may have been some Saccharomyces eubianus DNA that had made its way into Uvarum, suggesting that there was a European population. And this is uh, where we came in. And this, uh, our discovery of Saccharomyces eubianus came from a few undergraduate projects a few undergraduate teaching modules that were set up at University College Dublin. And I have to say right from the start that these modules were not designed to hunt for Saccharomyces eubianus. We did know, we knew it was an interesting yeast. We, when we found it, we knew it was an interesting finding, but we didn't set out to search for Saccharomyces eubianus. What we set out to do was to teach undergraduates some of the magic of research. So to teach them instead of having set practicals to allow them to go out and investigate. And what we decided they should investigate was yeast species. And that was because that was my interest, the interest of my partner um, for a very long time, Ken Wolf. And we persuaded some of our fellow colleagues, Tygo Cronin and Padre Ogara, that it would be a good idea to put together a few modules where students would go out and try and isolate yeast from the environment and see what they could find. And we essentially came up with a protocol like this one here, which is based somewhat on some work from uh, Chris Todd Hittinger in, in um, Wisconsin. It's a very simple protocol. The students collect soil samples from wherever they can find them. They inoculate them into a highly glucose rich media. They allow them to grow. They repeat that process. They then uh, plate out whatever it is that they've found on the um, on non-selective media, we isolate individual colonies, we PCR amplify some of the ribosomal DNA um, and then sequence the ribosomal DNA and that let, uh, lets us identify the species. And then in the second module, the students choose some interesting isolates that they found here and they uh, sequence the entire genomes and um, then have a look at, do some genome analysis. So we have two different undergraduate research modules. They've been running since about since 2018 now. And we usually identify somewhere around 100 isolates a year belonging to uh, about 20 to 30 species. It's been a fairly um, 
popular and successful module. So what I'm listing here are some of the genomes, some of the species whose genomes we've completely sequenced. We've also involved some uh, primary school children in, at schools all over Ireland who have collected soil samples and we've identified yeast from those samples. And then in 2021, which was during the COVID pandemic, it was our first time back on campus full time. I decided that rather than have the students collect samples from random places, we would restrict them to the UCD campus. So this is the campus of University College Dublin. It's quite large, 133 acres. The university here dates from the 1960s, but the land is much older than that. There's, it's based on um, a lot of estate grounds, some of them which date back right to the 12th century. So there are some wooded areas which are fairly old and there are some which are, are, are quite recent. So we sent the students around the various wooded areas and asked them to collect soil samples and see what they could find. And in this area down here, which is actually close to the horticultural um, part of UCD, which is has some very old trees in it, Stephen Allen um, isolated two um, samples which he showed where um, Saccharomyces ubianus. Now, when I say he showed they were Saccharomyces ubianus, he sequenced the ribosomal DNA. I looked at the ribosomal DNA. There's not very much difference between the sequence of Saccharomyces ubianus and other Saccharomyces species. So we thought it was a possibility. Maybe this is what we had found. Maybe some students had gone drinking in the woods and spilled a few bottles of lager and we were looking at Saccharomyces pastorianus. And we decided that the fastest way to figure out what we had was to sequence the whole genome. Because we had MIN9 in-house, we could do that quite rapidly. I was sitting in the lab waiting for the sequences to come off the MIN9, putting them straight into BLAST. And we were really quite excited to find that the two isolates he had found were in fact Saccharomyces ubianus. And I have a few statistics there for those of you who are interested, but I just want to make the point that the sequencing is to very high quality. So we've sequenced chromosomes end to end, all 16 chromosomes in both isolates plus the mitochondrial genome. And we used a combination of MIN9 sequencing to give long reads and DNB sequencing to give short and accurate re reads in or order to um, come up with a final um, accurate genome assembly. So our first question was, do the Irish isolates look anything like the immediate ancestor of um, Saccharomyces pastorianus. And we're back to this phylogenetic tree that I showed you earlier. And if you remember this little purple group or the Halartic clade, and sitting right in the Halartic clade are our two Irish isolates. So yes, their genomes do look like the Saccharomyces ubianus part of the Saccharomyces pastorianus genomes shown here. However, they're not quite as close to the Pastorianus isolates as the Tibetan genome sequences are. And another way to look at this is to look at the individual bases that are shared between the different isolates. So what we're looking at here is a, a diagram showing one chromosome from Saccharomyces ubianus, comparing it to the, the two different lineages of Saccharomyces pastorianus. And essentially, we look for places where the various Ubianus isolates, the American ones, the Irish ones, and the Tibetan ones, have different bases. And then we ask, well, which base in the Ubianus isolate is the same as the one in the Pastorianus? So, for example, these blue ones here are shared between Pastorianus and the Tibetan isolates, whereas the pink ones are shared between Pastorianus and the Irish isolates. And overall, we uh, estimate that about 55% uh, about of the Saccharomyces pastorianus genome comes from something that's very closely related to the Tibet Tibetan isolates of Saccharomyces ubianus, about 40% from the Irish isolates, and about 5% from the American isolates. And there are a few differences between the two lineages that I can talk about later, if anyone is particularly interested. Okay, so we have isolated Saccharomyces umianus from Ireland. We've isolated it from a university campus just right outside our labs. So one of the first questions was, well, 
is there really an Irish population of Saccharomyces euboeanus? So we got our first two isolates from the UCD campus in 2021. The following year, a visiting American study abroad student took the module. She went back to the same place on campus and she re-isolated um, the species. So now we had, we had three isolates. By this point, all the PhD students in the lab were getting involved and they were collecting soil samples and they were looking to see what they could identify. And in the same year, Matthew Osborne, a PhD student, went to a large oak tree at the back of a farm, uh, collected a soil sample and identified Saccharomyces eubianus. This summer, for the first time, we decided we would actively look for this species. So we traveled around as many old oak forests as we could, assuming that Saccharomyces was going to be associated with oak forests. And we are still um, analyzing that, that those samples. In fact, our undergraduates are doing that right now. But we're pretty sure that we have already isolated one. So uh, a final year undergraduate student, Yiran Zhao, Zhao, has isolated one from an oak forest uh, over here. So these, are, these two sites are about 80 kilometers apart. These two are about 50 kilometers apart. I will point out that we've sampled the east and the south relatively well, but we haven't looked at samples from the west and the north. So is there an Irish population? Probably yes. Is it a very large population? Probably no. It's certainly not on the level of Patagonia. Just to make the point that these are all related to each other, so they've all got UCD names here. These are the three that come from the UCD campus. They're very, very similar. And then the one that comes from down here is a little bit different. And we haven't sequenced, we haven't sequenced the, the entire genome of that. The second question that our students ask quite a bit is, will the Irish isolates make a decent beer? And the answer is, at the moment, probably no. So one of the problems is that the uh, Irish Saccharomyces eubianus isolates do not like to metabolize maltose. So the main sugars in the beer wort, maltose, maltotriose, uh, so it's important that they are metabolized and converted to alcohol. And if we just look at the growth of the yeast strain, so our top one down here is uh, South American Saccharomyces eubianus. These are colonies growing on glucose very happily, growing on maltose very happily. And here are our two original Irish isolates. They grow fine on glucose. They don't grow so well on maltose. We're not quite sure why. They don't metabolize maltose because maltose is metabolized by this, uh, the end, the genes encoded in this sort of an operon structure here. One encodes a maltase enzyme, breaks down the maltose. One encodes a maltose transporter, and one encodes a regulator that controls expression of these two genes. And we know that at least one of the Irish isolates has at least one intact um, maltose type operon here. So we're not quite sure uh, why they don't use maltose, but we have tried to make beer. And in the words of the Wicklow Hop Company, what they generate at the moment is uh, diabetes in a glass. So very, very, very sugary. But we are hoping that we will find more isolates or that we'll be able to encourage them to grow well in maltose. So in conclusion, um, the isolation of Saccharomyces eubianus in Ireland does suggest that the species exists in Europe or did exist in Europe at some time. We're not quite sure why it hasn't been found um, elsewhere. Perhaps people have been uh, using too complicated systems. Perhaps our very, very simple method just happened to work. Perhaps they're looking in the wrong place. Um, the Irish isolates do share some similarity with Saccharomyces pastorianus, but um, it is not clear what the exact ancestor of the lager yeast is. So perhaps there is another population, perhaps in Germany or somewhere in Central Europe, waiting to be discovered that is related to both the Tibetan and the Irish population, and that is more closely related to the Saccharomyces um, pastorianus lager yeasts. And I want to uh, just finish briefly by saying that we very much enjoyed the experience of publishing this paper, particularly because it came from an undergraduate project. So Stephen Allen in the center here is the undergraduate who found the yeast. 
John Bergen is a PhD student who did all the uh, genomic analysis. And this led to quite a lot of attention, and uh, not only academic attention, but also from many uh, media organizations. So the students very much enjoy that. And I'm just gonna leave it here by thanking several people. So first of all, we are not, we, we're not a Saccharomyces eubianus lab, we're becoming one. But I really want to thank all the various individuals who've carried out all the research um, before us. I want to thank the class of 2021 who isolated the yeast that included Saccharomyces eubianus. And I want to thank particularly the Butler and Wolf Labs and the students who have continued to work on this project. And thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, Geraldine, for for that uh, um, for that talk, which was a it was a science talk, but also a historical talk, which 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 will link nicely to our our, our longer term history that that Matthias is going to talk about in in a moment. Uh, I see lots of, I, I was going to say thumbs up and applause. As I saw a couple of oh, love hearts as well. This is this this is great. This must be your fan club. Uh, the, the, um, you didn't mention at the end, but it's it's good to see as as you've told me before that 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 you're a boffin, so that the, the sun uh, recognizes this. Um, if people have questions uh, related to Geraldine's talk or comments that you would like uh, me me to make, uh, please put them into the Q and A, and um at the at the end I will I will bring them into the discussion. I can see some very interesting discussion points myself already, but um. It'd be great uh, if if some of you people out there uh, listening also also have questions that you would like raised. So I'm going to now uh, pass over to uh, our second speaker of I'm going to say the afternoon afternoon in Europe morning in uh, in in the west of the uh, whole Arctic uh, region and evening in the east relative to me anyway of the whole Arctic region. So. Um, so uh, very pleased uh, to have Matthias Hutzler uh, pr pr present next. Matthias, uh, thank you, and the floor is yours. So, John, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and also thank you because uh, you're also author of this paper. So we did a massive historic research, and we tried to combine historic facts and historic data with genetic data and try to find how the lager yeast evolved, how Saccharomyces pastorianus um, evolved, how this hybridization event took place. And I also think that uh, those two talks fit very good together because you, Geraldine, you told us the story about Eubianus, so this will not be the focus of my talk. I will just mention it briefly. Um, and I will focus on the Cerevisiae parental part, and then also about a potential hybridization scenario. Um, normally, my colleague Martin um, um, would be part of this presentation and do the first part, but unfortunately, he couldn't make it because he uh, just uh, will arrive uh, in a few minutes from Brussels, so I will do both parts. I also called it like pre and post hybridization. One is more in the middle age and the other one is more than the real hybridization and then the post hybridization scenario, how I call it. So let's get started. So um, what is yeast uh, and especially brewing yeast? Brewing yeast, um, it's more or less a black box, or it was a black box. Um, when brewers used yeast, so it, they knew how to use it, but they did not really know how the metabolism worked and how aroma compounds were produced. And uh, it's very important to know that the yeast, depending on the species or the strain, um, <clears throat> determines the aroma of the beer, so more than 70% of the beer aroma uh, come from the yeast metabolism. So when you have barley malt and hops and make this nice beer word, this biotransformation is done by the by yeast. 
And uh, when you compare word and beer, it's like two words. And when you make lager beer, it's a very special neutral beer. When you produce yeast, uh, wheat beer or ale beer, it's more aromatic. And then we have some like, special yeast for sour beers or low alcohol beers. But yeast is crucial for the beer aroma. And now uh, the focus is on the lager yeast, Saccharomyces pastorianus. So what is so special about this yeast species, about this hybrid? One thing, it's the cryotolerance. It can um, ferment at very low temperatures, as, as John mentioned. It has a very good sedimentation, so you can crop it from the bottom. That's also where the uh, name came from in German, like Untergierige Hefe, so bottom fermenting yeast. It makes this special, typical beer aroma. It's puff negative, so this means it does not produce for vinyl guiacol, so this clove like flavor or spicy flavor. It has a strong pH drop, so that makes beer safe to low pH. As Cheryl mentioned, it ferments maltose and maltotriose. So it has a very high fermentation degrees and produces quite a high amount of alcohol and has a very strong and robust fermentation performance. So this is the other characteristics, characteristics of the yeast. And those are the characteristics of the beer, of the lager beer. So why? became lager beer the most successful beer in the world. Spe special thing is that there is not so much special uh, character, not so special aromas. It's quite neutral, no strong aroma and very balanced. It's also refreshing and crisp and has a very balanced mouthfeel also according to this long lagering process. So there's a strong sedimentation. But this leads to a very good drinkability. This is the reason why you can drink two or three or four beers with um, not a, um, let's say, a lot of negative effects on the human body and the health. It's also one uh, very important point that it also forms less fermentation byproducts, esters and higher alcohols, and it does not grow at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. Imagine uh, and think about the times when beers were not filtered, so yeast were alive and not, beers were not pasteurized, but uh, those yeast, they do not grow and affect the digestion so much. So now I structured my talks into three uh, major parts. I call it the three H. One is the hybrid nature of the lager yeast. This is the largest part. The history of lager beer and lager yeast. You can here uh, see a, a picture of an old lager cellar from the 14th century. And this is a lot of historic research. And then one smaller part, this is, I call it the yeast hunting part, hunting for lager beers. So we did the same like Geraldine did. We took thousands of samples. We have not found Ubayanos in um, Middle Europe yet. Um, and I also have some hypothesis why we haven't found it yet. So in brief, um, as John already showed us, Pastoranus is a hybrid, and those are the two major characteristics. The cryotolerance from Eubayanus and this high fermentation performance of the Cerevisiae part. So, and our big question of this historic research was when and why this hybrid was formed. When was the birth of Saccharomyces pastorianus. And according to this um, publication of Jean-Marc Daran's group, Salazar et al., we know that it only was one hybridization event. And before we started the study, we knew that this hybridization event must have taken place um, 
in a time between 1400 after Christ, Anno Domini, and 1883. So this was the first pure isolation by Emil Christian Hansen. And around 1400, um, lager beer production started in northern Bavaria. So where does the hybridization partner one come from? Um, so we know now from Geraldine's talk where it has been found so far, also, let's say the plant species Eubayanus is associated with, and we have not found it here in Middle Europe yet. Um, probably there was a holarctic um, population or a related population also in, in Middle Europe. Um, but let's see. Um, so this ancestor is not completely discovered. But as I told you, I will focus on parent two, I call it, or the parental partner from the Saccharomyces cerevisiae side. Where did it come from? So there were these nice uh, publications of Jose, San, uh, uh, Jose Paolo Sampaio uh, and also the Verstritten group uh, that showed us which um, Cerevisiae strains belong to which Saccharomyces cerevisiae clusters. And well, now we know that we have this beer cluster, beer cluster one and beer cluster two. And this was like <clears throat> a fundamental work be before the Verstreetengrut and Galone et al. could um, um, compare the Saccharomyces cerevisiae subgenome of the lager yeast of both uh, lineages, the Froberg and the Salz lineage, with the Cerevisiae uh, clades. And the finding was, and the result was, that the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome must have been a wheat beer yeast. So the uh, wheat beer brewing yeasts are the closest to the Saccharomyces cerevisiae subgenome of the lager yeast. And there are also some Munich strains, wheat beer strains in this cluster here. So, and when we got those results in 2019, so we was already knew also the results a little bit before we focused our research, our historic research into this wheat beer direction. So we knew Saccharomyces cerevisiae hybridization partner was very likely a wheat beer yeast strain. So now the next part of this presentation starts, the history of lager beer and lager yeast. Who's interested in this uh, <clears throat> research and this all its historic facts, I can recommend to read this uh, quite recent um, paper in FEMS yeast research. Um, and um, it will take too long, but I will highlight the most important findings. So what we know that the original bottom fermenting core region is in Northern Bavaria. So Bavaria is here one of the Southern states in Germany and this Northern part um, is called Franconia and Upper Palatinate. So these are like sub-states and um, in the North, and in the east, there are mid mountain ranges. So it's like separated from um, other parts of Germany or Czech Republic or Bo the Bohemian part of Czech Republic. And this region was the starting point of the lager, lager beer production. This is uh, very well documented. So 1300 to 1400 AD lager beer brewing started and at around 1400 lager brewing was <clears throat> uh, spread around the whole region and this was the dominant beer in this region and here are some nice 
pictures of this logabarine series. So there is another major fact, very important fact. At this time, a small ice age started. So there was a volcano in the Pacific, volcano explosion. Um, there were less sun days and more ice days. So these are three different climber, uh, climate um, um, measurement facts uh, and uh, methods. And you could see here, there were also less sun activity, um, <clears throat> sulfate in um, Greenland, um, um, uh, ice was less and also uh, ice days um, uh, uh, correlate with these facts. And this is the population in Germany. You can see there's not much population. And there were a lot of, let's say, horrible scenarios like wars past the 30 year during war. Let's say until the French Revolution, it was not the easiest time. But during this time, this cold fermentation and this cold gear was used. This is like a word for cold yeast. And there it's very well documented that this um, Cold brewing and also lager brewing started here at that time where also this cold period, climate period started. So what happened due to this climatic change? In the middle of Bavaria also wine was produced uh, and with the cold climate, it's also well documented that the wines and or especially the grapes did not um, grow so well and wine production became more difficult. And this was the perfect time that the lager beer that was already very well established spread throughout Bavaria, also to the south of Bavaria, towards Munich. So lager beer brewing spread. And then there was another major point, the purity law. And 1516, this is like the formula for lager beer brewing, barley malt, hops, and uh, no other ingredients, yeast is not mentioned, but for sure, this was at the time where lager brewing was already the, the dominant brewing style, and there were only a few wheat beer islands with ex exceptions. So, and after uh, 15, 16, you also need special exceptions, special permissions to brew uh, top fermenting. I also have uh, this small reminder, keep in mind that before 1883, everything was a mixed culture. There were no pure culture. So they were speaking about top fermenting yeasts and top fermenting Stellhefen. Stellhefen is this word for mixed culture. And for sure there were like thermotolerant um, species in this top fermenting cultures like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, maybe also Paradoxus aureus. We do not know, we have not found them in modern uh, um, yeasts or yeast mixtures. So this would, be the picture of a top fermenting uh, open vessel. And um, in bottom fermentation, where you have the sediment at the bottom, for sure there were any cryotolerant species, because this was the, also the selection criteria. You made permanently cold and subsequent cold fermentation. And those um, species probably also were in this um, um, Stellhefen in this bottom fermenting Stellhefen. And all those yeast already ha have been found in brewing cultures. Only those with the Brackens have not found. And for sure, there were also non saccharomyces yeast involved. But please keep in mind during this period of time, no pure cultures. So, as I told you, um, the core region 
of lager brewing and cold brewing was northern Bavaria. It spread to the south. Whole Bavaria uh, was a lager brewing country. And keep, please keep in uh, mind that yeast did not travel far at this time. So normally you exchange yeast from brewery to brewery within a town, but yeast in um, usually only traveled over long distance when the brewmaster changed. And that's what we could find um, in historic documentation that the brewmaster from Schwarzach came to the Munich Hofbräuhaus. And why? Because this family, this wheat beer brewing aristocratic family died out. And this wheat beer islands, I call it, they were right, like money printing machines. And the Duke of Bavaria, uh, who was in Munich, was very intelligent and also <laughs> had an interest to get this right of wheat beer brewing. And then between 1602 and 1615 in Munich in the Hofbräuhaus, this was the only uh, place where top fermentation, wheat beer brewing, and bottom fermenting lager brewing took place in a very high quantity for around 13 years in one place under one roof. And those Stellhefen, Stellhefen disease mixtures probably also have been mixed. So this is our most likely scenario. This was also one very special beer from Einbeck that came in the same time period to Munich, to the Hofbräuhaus, also with the brewmaster Elias Pichler. And they brewed a very strong beer, the Bock beer from Einbeck there, also the, uh, at the end of this period. So there were two special yeast strains entering this scenario in Munich. Um, and this is our, our, our two main hypotheses that those yeast mixtures were the origin of the lager um, yeast hybrid. <clears throat> and later on, the yeast traveled to Copenhagen and the yeast was isolated there by Emil Christian Hansen and then traveled back to Munich. But this is much later and then the age of the pure cultures arose. So those are the three hypotheses we mention in our paper. So the most probable scenario we think is that there must have been um, a Ubayanus, like a Bavarian uh, Ubayanus culture in those Stellhefen, in those cold Stellhefen yeast mixtures that probably uh, formed this hybrid with the Cerevisie lineage from the wheat beer brewery Schwarzach during this period of time. Another scenario could have been that the other parental part was the Einbeck uh, Cerevisie part, or that with this Bohemian mixture that came also from Schwarzach, that there was already a uh, a Pastorianus there, because Schwarzach was also surrounded, let's say, by lager brewing um, scenarios. So those are our three main hypotheses. So we cannot prove until we really have artifacts with <clears throat> old Stellhefen DNA, but um, I'm looking forward to what the future will bring. So this is like a summary our main and most likely hybridization scenario that the Munich Stellhefe mixture contained the Ubayanus, a Bavarian or Bohemian Ubayanus, and that the Stellhefe from Schwarzach with, from the wheat beer side came in. And during this period of around 13 years, those two yeast lineage formed the new Pastorianus from the Hofbräuhaus. That was then, uh, after this hybridization event, part of this Stel Stellhefen fraction and probably became one major part of this new bottom fermenting Stellhefen fraction. 
And this was subsequently used for brewing and exchange in Munich and was the predominant uh, brewing yeast mixture in Munich. Breweries exchanged uh, yeast cultures. And then 1883, the pure Carlsbergensis or later Pastorianus was uh, isolated by Emil Christian Hansen. Now this is the scenario post uh, hybridization. So we think uh, 1615 uh, Stellhefen mixture containing the Pastorianus um, was in this Hofbräuhaus. Uh, 1680 uh, yeast could be observed by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek under the microscope. 1789, the elector Karl Theodor revoked the wheat beer monopoly. So wheat beer was had no importance anymore in Bavaria. And this is very important. Gabriel Sedelmeier, so this is a picture, became head brewer of the Hofbräuhaus, House. And one year later, he bought the Oberspartenbräu, now known as Spartan and brewed lager beer there. And um, he sent the yeast to a different location and bought more breweries. And then it's documented that the son of Jacobson, uh, Jacobson, the founder of the Carlsberg Brewery, carried the Spartan yeast to Copenhagen. Um, then uh, 1871, so this is a sign of industrialization. Um, lager beer also could be brewed all year long, not only in the cold periods until March. Um, then the yeast was isolated and this friendship um, <clears throat> also brought back the yeast to Munich. So the pure strains from uh, Hansen were also used in Munich, Munich then. And this is a like a small um, summary. So this is now the current Hofbräuhaus, but this is not where the hybridization event, this is the, was the rebuilt wheat beer uh, Hofbräuhaus. So unfortunately, the old Hofbräuhaus doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. It's close to the Zerwerk Gebäude. It's the second oldest uh, building still uh, present in Munich and it, it's closed. It was the next building to this building, but it doesn't exist anymore. Unfortunately, the building where probably this hybridization event took place. And this is a, a picture of the Schwarzach Brewery, but this was also rebuilt, so it's not the original status. Um, so we think the prop, this is the most probable scenario when you go back and forth in time that this hybridization event must have been happened there. I'm sorry, what I forgot is to mention that the genetic calculation according to Galone and Kevin Verstrittenskum, they frame this time here that the hybridization took place between 1550 and 1800. And our hypothesis or hypothetic scenarios is in between. Then only one brief side story. There was also a debate about uh, pure culture beer brewing. So, you know, those guys, one, Emil Christian Hansen, Jakobsen and Sedelmeier, those are the beers you know now produced with pure cultures. Paul Lindner, a very famous microbiologist, he also invented a method to isolate single yeast cells and make pure cultures, but they said, it's better to inoculate the propagated and cultivated yeast into the Stellhefen environment, into the mixture that you do not lose uh, evolution, and you don't, do not lose pressure. And they also said, the Berlin guys, the beer tastes empty, tastes like water. So there were some scientific discussion, but we all know those guys won, but also, it's very interesting that now mixed cult, uh, cultures and mixed uh, propagation and um, are now of importance and um, maybe will also regain importance. We also looked, this is now the third part of the talk, looked uh, in Middle Europe and took thousands of isolates and I wrote a book 
uh, this was the, uh, are the main results of my habilitation thesis. Who is interested can uh, download it here on research gate or look into the book. And we called it like yeast hunting and we looked in a lot of brewing places and also brewing uh, related raw materials. And we always try to isolate the yeast and identify it as Geraldine did and also make beer with it. For this, um, let's say, yeast hunting and the, um, and the search for the yeast, we also checked the life cycle uh, of Emil Christian Hansen and uh, where the yeast could be found, how they are also um, um, used by plants uh, to attract vectors and this, this picture, um, let's say, um, also shows that we have to use bark and soil because those are the major points uh, where yeast stays over winter also in middle Europe. And when you think about brewing material and equipment, this is a picture of oak uh, uh, wood. And this is uh, spring wood that grows very fast and autumn wood. And you have a lot of holes and bubbles inside when you think about yeast uh, and other micros attaching brewing equipment, it's a, a perfect scenario to settle. So that's also why we check woods and not always or only bark. That's only some impression about our yeast hunting. Uh, this was in Georgia, uh, Caucasus region last year. These are just some pictures how we characterize the yeast. So we make like a preliminary beer, some phenotypic tests, some tasting. When we have some interesting isolates, we also do pilot trials in pilot brewing plants and fermentation plants. We get some uh, major parameters, fermentation degrees, alcohol, aroma, cough formation. And when we check this middle European um, uh, population and the middle European, especially Bavarian uh, isolates, our main isolates we found in Bavaria were Juvarum, Paradoxus, Yuri, and Cerevisie, mainly Paradoxus and Juvarum. But unfortunately, um, no Jubayanus um, or for example, Kudra CV, the black boxes are those that were already found in brewing. We did also metagenomics here from the center of Bavaria. So this was the main lager brewing region and in the center of Bavaria. Uh, um, we took pool samples, did word enrichment, also cool enrichment. And here we find Paradoxus and Uvarum, and that's, I think, the current picture. The, the next slide, it's only, let's say, some success stories. We also used Yuri strains, Paradoxus strains, some hybrids from old bottles, some Bayanus, Ubayanus Uvarum hybrids for brewing. We used Cerevisia strains from our Caucasus uh, um, um, tour from hops, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae isolated from hops from 1,900 meters and some um, cerevisiae from Caucasian mountain beer from such mountain breweries. Um, we also used this uh, hybrid from an old bottle to rebrew a beer according to a recipe of 1672. And uh, we also used some yeast isolates from Celtic plants or very important holy Celtic plants to make something like a Celtic retro beer. Or we also um, isolated old Pastorianos some, from some old, some old freeze dried samples from our institute and resurrected some very important old strains. So, what is our outlook? For sure, we want to go deeper and prove uh, some of those hypotheses. The next steps will be to do whole genome sequences um, of Saccharomyces cerevisiae wheat beer strains that um, 
we still have at our institute or that are still active in some breweries and check if we can learn more from this lineage, from the Cerevisie wheat beer lineage and maybe find the closest relative of the Pastorianus Cerevisie parent. Then the next step would be to take soil samples uh, close to North Bavarian breweries in soil la layers from 1400 to 1800. Because uh, we think probably there was a Eubayanus population there, but we also think it disappeared after the warm period started again in 1840, uh, 50, around 1850. And that's maybe also the big difference to Ireland, where uh, this um, small ice age maybe was not so strong or it was not so affected. And also this warm period afterwards was not that severe or strong. And the question is, did Eubayanus disappear in Middle Europe after the warm period started? And maybe we find some ancient DNA uh, like um, uh, it was mentioned that there was already found some DNA uh, in northern Italy um, that could be an indication for this population. And what would be the best to find old brewing artifacts and also do ancient DNA analysis and prove how the Stelhaven population um, was composed? Uh, did it contain Eubayanus, Eubaum, Cerevisiae? The bad thing is, at the time, they did not have bottles. Uh, and when we find wooden artifacts, it's often very difficult to find anything, and it's often very degraded. And the fourth aim is to brew and drink great, great beers and also make some historic beers. Sorry, it took a little bit longer. Um, sorry, uh, and thank you very much for your attention. Matthias, thank you very much. Uh, I can confirm that the warm period has not come to Ireland yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I was saying lots of congratulatory messages and hearts. I saw some hearts during your talk as well, so I think people liked the, the German accent. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's, and... It's, it's half German, half Bavarian. Oh, okay. <laughs> also, it also has got a hybrid nature, you know. Okay, the hybrid accent. I, 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 excellent. Um, so that was great. Thank you very much. And what I'm going to do now, I'll, I'll um, and I thank you also, Ger Geraldine, for your talk. Um, people, uh, please feel free to. Uh, continue to ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, I, I, I can read these. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm looking at the questions here and myself, and I'm just going to ask um, a couple of them to the speakers. Um, Just, uh, I'm going to ask uh, um, Matthias just uh, about the, the, the Stellhafen and um, the question, I'll read it. At a time when the Stellhafen was still used for brewing, do you know if there was any selection process before inoculation? Did the brewers um, optimize the community in Stellhafen? Yeah, that's a question, I think, yeah. Yeah, uh, for sure, they optimized it. There were also descriptions to take uh, when to take uh, Stellenhefen from, from the bottom from the bottom from the barrels, how to lager it and how to reuse it, um, and I'm pretty sure uh, that with trial and error there uh, was optimization that they mixed cultures and also used different kinds of words. It means substrates to optimize uh, those Stellhefen. And for sure, uh, there were also other hybrids like Bayanus uh, that we still know. So, yeah. Oh, okay. And 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 so you, you would say that, I mean, people were optimizing, so probably there, there was selection and a certain amount of domestication happening, would you say, in, in the Stellhefen as well? Yes. I think... Uh, the, the brew masters, uh, and there, there was also a, a, a profession called Hefner, 
the have now. Uh, this was like more the yeast storage guy that mm -hmm. uh, uh, took the yeast over the, the let's say the non-brewing periods. And the brewmasters, uh, they were responsible to keep the yeast alive. They did not know that it was a microbe, but this 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 German word it was called Zeug. Zeug is like thing, uh, but thing uh, this Zeug has more like also um, like a living nature. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so they knew that it was active, and uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that they also tried. Um, uh, the same things like in barley breeding and uh, hops breeding that they also did uh, yeast breeding without knowing um, or let's say more adaption, yeast adaption without knowing that this is a yeast it's uh, like a thing adaption yeah mm -hmm. okay and just while we're talking about the Stellhef and uh, um, the, 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 those, those questions were from uh, from Rike this is a question from uh, Kirana and um I've wondered this question as well. The question is, do you have any idea how the yeast strains uh, maintained their equilibrium in mixed culture? I mean, uh, one, one can think going back to the original Stellhaven, but you can also think after, um, you, you know, after Pasteurianus emerged and after the Froberg and Satz lineages diverged, I, I, you, you know, that, that, that competition didn't eliminate mm -hmm. um, some lineages. Yeah. So, um, when you have uh, yeast mixtures, um, it's like in spontaneous brewing, when you take the same substrate under the same uh, envi environmental conditions, like same temperature and same procedure, in most cases you have like a stable balance and stable equilibrium uh, of certain main actors, uh, then you often have like 95% of one strain, and then three, two percent of some side actors. Uh, and then you have like a stable consortium. And I think that was the same there after the hybridization, let's say the, the, uh, the Pastorianos, let's say the original Pastorianos was part of this main fraction. And later you had the sorts and Froberg fractions, and you know, Sartz is more cryotolerant, and uh, Froberg uh, is stronger in fermentation. And I think on the then, depending on the technology of each of each uh, individual brewery, uh, those fractions became the stronger fraction in colder brewing, or so in the later process, Sartz Sartz became more predominant and in let's say higher temperature depending on the substrate Frobert was mm -hmm. um, and then later on we humans decided to use Froberg because it has a higher fermentation degree and performance and is more high performance okay thanks um I, I'll switch over to, to Geraldine for a couple of questions um and Andreas is asking I I, I, th I think um a kind of a question that 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 a lot of people are wondering about, and he says that I uh, didn't understand whether the Irish Eubianus isolates came directly from South America or maybe Tibet, or whether they somehow result from um says a deherbalization of S S pasturanus, um, so so I I I I guess uh Ger Geraldine, this is a question for you, and and maybe it relates to the kind of the. The slight admixture type uh, that that you describe as well. Could could you comment on that? Yeah, so that's a good question, and I don't. We can't really answer it yet. So we know that all the Ubianas came out of South America, but and they would have moved northway northward. So probably the the end of the last ice age, twenty one thousand years ago, so they moved north. But I don't know how they got to Europe. And did they so did the Irish ones come from the West or did they come from the East? And I don't think we're going to know that until we have populations right across Europe or across at least more geographical areas anyway. And then 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 to look. They're not they're, they are at Saccharomyces eubianus. They're not a breakdown of of 
Saccharomyces pastorianus. So because we find them in different places and they're slightly different. Okay. And um, just just while I have you there, the um, you know, because uh, Matthias was mentioning Sats and Froberg, and 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 you showed one slide there where you're I think looking at chromosome sixteen, and where you showed one region, uh, that one in that's um, yeah. it could either come from the Tibet or from the uh, from from yeah. the uh, other one, uh, yeah. the Irish. Can you explain that a bit? Yeah. So so. We know that they that all of the lineage is descended from a single hybridization. Yeah, we don't know exactly what happened. Uh, so what was involved in that hybridization? So they were probably diploids to start with. Both parents are diploids, and then within those diploids, there's the much variation. So you, so you could end up with one copy going to some descendants, and the other copy going to other ones, or there could have been a bit of back crossing after the original hybridization so you might have had extra crosses to either to 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 Ubiana, so that some lineages end up with slightly different parts okay so so i, I what i'm gathering there as well so so the, the, your, your your data would still support or, or at least be consistent with with, with the single hybridization event that yeah, uh, yeah. that's been proposed yeah definitely yeah um, it doesn't suggest anything else yeah, that's, that's 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 what I thought. Um, there's there's a couple of questions, uh, Geraldine, from different people asking just about the isolation. Um, and maybe Matthias can comment after this because he's done so much of this as well. But it says when we want to isolate a yeast, uh, this is from Furkin. Um, how should we decide where to take the sample from, and what parameters should you take into account? Um. Yeah. So it depends on exactly what you want. We just so we decided we wanted our, our labs were interested in budding yeasts. So we wanted budding yeasts. We didn't want filamentous fungi um, because we were working with undergraduates and we wanted things that were easy to grow and easy to sequence. Um, so soil is a fantastic repository <laughs> source of, of yeasts. There, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands. So any soil sample will have yeast in it. Now, if you want Saccharomyces species, some ties will know a lot more about how to look specifically for Saccharomyces. But there's a fair bit of evidence that they're associated with, with oak trees or with other, other tree species. But even there, the soils are often easier than taking them from the bark because they're in the soils all year, all year round and they may not be on the bark all year round. Okay. So uh... any, any soil for just a generic yeast. Any sort, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Matthias, would you add anything to that? Yeah, um, I can confirm uh, that soil is a great source. And um, when we sampled, let's say, oaks or ash tree or mistletoe, we um, also found the same yeast, even yeast strains on the bark and in the soil. So this is a, it's like one ecosystem but uh, related uh, to the tree. So you, if you take soil far away from a tree, it can have completely different yeast microbiota. But if you take it close to the tree, you probably find the same that are on the bark. But it also de depends on the bark. So rougher barks like oaks or ash tree, it's, uh, they are harboring th those Saccharomyces yeast easier. Yeah, beech tree. We did not. We find some, found some, but uh, uh, not so much. We also think the bark is quite important, and also the tree sap. Yeah, I think there is also some specific characteristics coming from the tree sap, and we uh, like also Lindner already uh, recognized that there can also be protection from the yeast when the, the tree is injured. And the uh, yeast grow there, you will not have filamentous fungi growing there or pas phytopathogenics growing there. Okay, and, and a minor technical question. Now, I mean, when you're isolating soil, are, are you from, from around a particular tree? Are, are you scraping from the surface or are you digging down one meter or is it somewhere in between that? Uh, so, so we do it like, uh, like 10 centimeters above uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the surface. Uh, below the surface yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
uh, we do not sample air, sorry. <laughs> yeah. We didn't go down quite that far, a few centimeters. Yeah, a few centimeters. Okay. And and um just maybe the last question on this particular topic. Uh this is from Luis in uh in, in, in Brazil and uh he's an undergraduate student. Um there's a huge Brazilian yeast hunting project ongoing at the moment and a big biodiversity project that I'm aware of. But um Lu Luis asks uh again it's about where you would sample uh, and it says should you be looking at things or, or can you use things like altitudes and temperatures and i suppose environmental criteria like that to help you select the place to, to isolate it says wild yeast um with similar profiles i guess similar profile meaning probably similar profiling to the ones that, that you would have isolated so it the assumption seems to be that the temperature is important. So there's, they, they may still be in Ireland because it was colder. So we need to go north. I mean, the country's not very big. There isn't there isn't a huge climate um, gradient, but we we would like to to look um, as far north as possible and see if there are more isolates there. Yeah, there's a couple of people have asked about Scandinavia. I know that's not the north of Ireland, but it is north of Ireland. Um, yes. uh, would Scandinavia be an interesting place to look? I would imagine yes. I don't know if anyone has tried. Uh -huh. yeah, there are all these great um, studies about the quake yeast that also contain Yubarum and uh, Cerevisius strains, but so far uh, they also have not found a pure Yubarum there. Um, and there, there is this brewing is connected to juniper trees, but uh, I don't know. It's a bigger, um, um, bigger study fo focusing on uh, environmental Eubianos isolates from Scandinavia. I think the same, Geraldine. Yeah, yeah. Scotland maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so Francisco has a question for Geraldine. Um, Yeah, it says if, if SU bias is rare and not the fittest, enriching methods might not be the best option for the isolation. Would you agree with that? I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that you didn't use an enrichment method, whereas most people looking for it do. Well, we did enrich a little. I mean, I mean we're, we're using high glucose and we're using low oxygen. So we're encouraging Saccharomyces and other yeasts um, and reducing filamentous fungi. But we didn't try like increasing ethanol. We didn't try growth of maltose. And as it turned out, that was just as well <laughs> because we wouldn't have found them. Um, we didn't try low temperatures. Um, so I'm, if we enrich even less, which I think is what he's suggesting, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what less we could do. Right. We're already giving it very good conditions to grow in um okay so then, yeah I, I don't know he maybe could suggest some things and we could we can try them so email he, yeah um yeah. De, 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 david uh navarro has been trying for two years in norway but but uh, no sacrifices yet okay um and i just i say i say just a comment from diego lipkent uh the, the isolator of of the original uh, he doesn't comment on 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 the picture of him, but um, he he hopes to see people in uh in in the homeland of uh Sacramento's Ubianos at the international workshop and brewing in Barlocha in November. So I'm not sure if any people are going to that. Um, so I saw a question earlier. I'm 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 looking for it again now. But uh, in a, it it was asking about whether whether we should be looking at mixed cultivations again for yeast production. Uh, what do you think of that, uh, Matthias? I think... Um, for beer. Yes. For beer, yeah. No, for beer, because um, as Lindner and Delbrück uh, mentioned, uh, those beers have very complex aroma profiles. And we lost a lot of this uh, aroma diversity also when we lost uh, this yeast diversity in the mixed 
microbiota, so where you can still recognize this biodiversity Belgium, Belgium, those guys, they really conserve those mixed cultures mm -hmm. and you can taste this complexity. And uh, everywhere around Europe, uh, we and also in indigenous beers, we had this complexity, but we made the perfect lager beer. It's the best drinkable beer, but um, there's also space for complexity, I think. Yeah. And uh, actually, it's Daniel who uh, should ask that question, and and he made a point as well that it wasn't just Linder who disagreed with Hansen. He said some of the uh, British and Irish also agreed with Linder, and he mentions George Harris Morris from Burton, who was very vocal. I think at uh, probably against the the use of pure cultures. Um. I think Daniel also has the insight here, the Irish insight. <laughs> so. <laughs> Definitely, there were more counter opinions. Yes. Yeah. Um. Graham, Graham Walker, uh, who's uh, has a question about the the puff, uh, you know the, the production of phenolic off flavors, and 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 he says, um, Saccharomyces euboianus is puff positive, but Saccharomyces pasteurianus is puff negative. Uh, why? So the the puff genes uh, they are not not active in uh, Pastorianos. Also those that came from the Cerevisi side. Uh, so um, to be honest, I don't not not now by heart now if it's the promoter region or which if there is a deletion anywhere, but they are not uh, active. But uh, I also have to mention during this period uh, of brewing until let's say 1900 or the late 19th century all beers also in the munich they were brown beers dark beers and uh, when there was this mixed culture definitely there were positive strains but with dark beers you do not recognize this puff flavor so strong when you for example Daniel had a comment before that Guinness, this is a puff positive yeast, you also have the club flavor, but do you, you do not recognize it that strong. Later in um, lager beers, in blonde beers, uh, pale beers, this flavor become more and more important as an off flavor. And then also those yeasts were selected with this criteria or uh, all ale yeasts and uh, uh, lager yeasts that were used to have this puff negative character for the successful beers. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the important point because while Saccharomyces cerevisiae are puff positive as well, it's exactly. the brewing ones that are not. So, so that 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 it's been selected for presumably Eubianus the same way. This was a domestication criteria, mm -hmm. selection criteria. Yes. Yes. And and uh, actually, just I mean, you the, the previous question question you referred to Daniel uh, Karush as well there on on the um on the puff and Guinness uh, for those interested, the, the Daniel just has a very recent very interesting paper around Guinness yeast strains and their phylogeny that was published that people might be interested in in looking up. Um, somebody I can't see it just now, but somebody asked about. Is climate change having any impact, or do you think, on efforts to isolate um, yeasts? Um, I, 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 I guess, is, is it going to mess up our efforts to, to find these uh, SUBIONUS populations, or do you think has any impact? I mean, I imagine it, it has, and that was one, one of the reasons we thought we'd try surveying Irish soils now was to see it are they going to do they change over time unfortunately we don't have historical records but lots of countries do so we'll be able to see what happens but i'm sure there are going to be be uh, quite dramatic effects i mean there are in the pathogenic yeast definitely they're moving as the climate gets warmer yeah i have the same opinion because you also recognize in the forests that really some uh, especially old trees are suffering because of dryness and those old yeast, that's my experience, they are perfect hosts for yeast populations. Um, these old giants are like the kings of the forests. And um, 
when we lose them, we also use a um, you know, universe of yeast with, with, with each old tree. And um, I also have the opinion that it, that also happened before, um, like 18, um, around 1850, when this small cold period stopped. Maybe we lost Eubayanus there in Central Europe. And maybe it survived in Ireland, or let's say also maybe in some parts of uh, the north part of Southern Europe, when the Gulf Stream um, touches uh, this uh, uh, shores. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Just. Uh, yeah. And, and, and of course, uh, the destruction of forests and everything over, over the years has yeah. compounded the issue. Um, actually, just a, a question from Brandon. Um, he's, he's asking whether bacteria like Lactobacilli uh, have influenced um, the selection or hybridization in the Stellhaven. This is kind of one for you. Definitely. Definitely, because that was the reason why lager brewing became so successful, because this beer with the cold brewing did not become sour that fast. So when you had this lager process over four weeks, six weeks, at very cold temperatures, it, uh, uh, the, the lactic acid bacteria could not compete with the yeast. And uh, also this long period of fermentation, when yeast is still proliferating and fermenting, it's very hard to compete for lactic acid bacteria during this active process. And that was the success of the lager beer because they did not become sour. Mm -hmm. And actually, a, a technical question. Indirectly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a, a technical question from uh, Heidi, Heidi Marie for, for you, uh, Matthias. Um, it was related to your future work, I think, because it says when you're looking for soil layers from 1400, how are you actually going to do this? Yeah, uh, that's not my special field. So we are already in touch with some ADNA researchers. Then we have to to um, to look for Asian DNA and maybe also make some intelligent sample selection. Yeah. yeah. Um... First work maybe with some preliminary PCR probes, uh, primazine probes, and then when we find some hot spots, then go deeper. Yeah. yeah okay. And um, Rika mentioned just answering an earlier question that they have seen paradoxes in Sweden, but but not not you by Um. There there's a, a comment uh, from Michael Sulu. Well, a question. He says, should we be proactively hybridizing Saccharomyces strains to produce new ales or lagers? So, um, well, I, I, I can comment, I think, you know, that people are trying to do this, but Matthias, uh, you, you, you've probably a lot of experience with this as well. So, uh, I do not uh, do uh, hybridization or rare mating in our lab, but a lot of other groups do and also quite successfully uh, but I'm not sure which strains will really make it to practical brewing or if you have them some special uh, you know uh, some groups they produced hybrids with higher fruity profiles and did it very successfully but also uh, you know what is so special about lager beer that it's very neutral so Will the fruitier beers become successful? I think definitely it's interesting for certain beer niches or for some special beers. Maybe you also make more neutral beers, but the, the lager beer itself, I think there is not much real optimization uh, for this lager beer profile. Yeah, and... Uh... Maybe, I... maybe in terms of production parameters, sustainability, yeah. that's what I can imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To make the beer at high temperature, yes, for sure, if you create beers without doing all this, this cryo effort. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I don't know, is Brian Gibson on, on the call? But I know Brian Gibson and his group have, have made some of these hybrids. And um, I think there's, there's a strain uh, commercialized by one of the yeast companies, a, a new hybrid um, commercialized earlier this year um, in, in North America. 
Um, there's lots of messages. I, I'm, I'm not going to read them out, but there's lots of messages. I've, I've thanked you guys for for the great presentations, and 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 um, and and uh, the discussion. I don't see any other questions that haven't um largely come up in 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 the course of of the discussion, and we've come to the the, the half past the hour, which is when I said that we would try and wrap up. So so I I, I will finish by um. Thanking again, uh, both, both Geraldine and uh, Matthias for really informative um, presentations. Um, thank you very much. Um, you published great papers, uh, and, but you, you presented that work very nicely. And I think it's been a very interesting discussion. I hope that people in attendance also enjoyed it. I think from the amount of thumbs up and other signs and from all the questions and comments pe people did. Um, I thank also all the attendees, you know, for for your engagement. We've had we had a couple of hundred people on. I didn't get the total number. There will be a recording available later on on the FEMS YouTube channel, and uh, I'll also thank then my FEMS colleagues and OUP colleagues for helping us put this together. So thank you every very much, everybody, and uh, from FEMS Yeast Research, the Yeast Community Journal, over and out. <laughs>